is great. Okay, so I'm just going to give a quick background on WEDGE. <clears throat> That's the acronym. Um, and then pass, pass it off to Joseph. But just want to explain that one of the reasons why WEDGE is really important is that it is very similar to LEED in the sense that it the, the LEED standard for energy efficiency for building, in the sense that it really encourages people, project owners, landowners, developers to go above and beyond what's minimally required by law or regulation. In the era of climate change, you may have heard if you're following some of the work in climate change right now that a lot of our laws and regulations have not kept up with the realities that we are facing in terms of the climate crisis. And WEDGE is one of those mechanisms and there isn't anything else like it really out there that really encourages and incentivizes going above and beyond to what should be, but is not yet the standard for design where water meets land. It is, these are some of the most complex designs and some of the most sought after places in the world. Humans are attracted to water, animals are attracted to water and aquatic animals need the water's edge for reproduction, for nurseries and for all types of life that, go, that goes on in aqua, aquatic ecosystems. So this is one of the most important places where we can be paying a lot of attention and putting the best effort towards important and critical resilient design. So um, with that, I'm going to pass it off to Joseph and to thank um, Colleen again for joining us from Scape Studios, one of the, the strongest and um, most important landscape design architecture firms in the world. Um, and if you've all heard about Kate Orff, she is the founder of Scape Studios and um, was uh, is one of the um, critical leaders in this area of practice um, nationally and internationally. So with that, I'll pass it off to Joseph and thank you so much. Great, thanks, Courtney. Uh, so we'll start with, uh, I'll spend 15 or, or 20 minutes going through like an overview of the wedge standard so you have kind of an understanding of what's in it, how it works and, and how it's structured to have the most impact. And then we'll switch to kind of a more um, interview-like conversation with Colleen as a, as a practicing landscape architect who's using wedge on, on projects um, and using the, the principles that are in it on a regular basis, um, talk to her about kind of how it shows up on, on the design side. So if I can get my slide to advance. Um, the way that, that Waterfront Alliance um, thinks about, about Wedge and the impact that it can have nationally is around this idea that with all the change that's happening on waterfronts, not just in, in New York and New Jersey, but across the country, so we're seeing the need to, to respond to, to climate change and address sea level rise and increasing storms, the transitions from industrial working waterfronts and manufacturing to, to more open space and residential, new funding opportunities coming from federal sources, there's a lot of change happening in on waterfronts across the country, and the goal of uh, of Wedge is to help communities, whether it's private developers or public sector projects. We want to help them get it right, because there's there these are the the projects that get built on the waterfront are have have lifespans of fifty years or more, oftentimes. So we get one bite at the apple to get it right on a particular site. And, and that's really how Wedge ties into the mission of building, transforming, revitalizing, and protecting accessible waterfronts. We want to help communities do those things right. So there are three main principles across Wedge. We look at the resilience of the site. How is it going to perform against climate hazards and other and, and other water-based hazards? What's the ecology of the site? How can you create a better ecosystem, encourage more biodiversity, particularly on urban waterfronts where we've lost a lot of that historically? How can we bring it back? And then we look at access. And I think of access as being very much a, a lowercase a around all kinds of different different ways that, that people can use a, a, a site. And I like to use Brooklyn Bridge Park here as an example, and this is a wedge verified site, one of the early ones to go through the standard. 
I'd like to use this as an example of kind of how resilience, ecology, and access show up. So I'll, I'll point out a number of features. These are all things that are encouraged by wedge and incentivized through wedge. So from a resilience perspective, you have changes in elevation at the park that are designed to protect some of the buildings and some of the, the assets on the site from flooding. You have changes in the shoreline shape. This is a former um, industrial port facility that was operational until, until the 1980s. The, they've changed the shoreline slope in a, in a way that attenuates and diffuses waves so that the, the impact of waves in a storm are not as significant and not as damaging. You have an improved stormwater system to, to handle increasing rain loads. So you have both on the like gray infrastructure side, the pipes and tanks, that's larger than it, that it would normally need to be, uh, or they're required to have it. But then there's also green infrastructure in there. There's a, a tidal marshland on this site that also has like filtration um, purposes for, for stormwater. So it cleans the, the stormwater before it enters, enters the harbor. And then even like there's a marina on the site that has a, a wave attenuator, again, something to slow down the waves that's built into the outermost pier of the marina that protects all the boats that are docked there. From an ecology perspective, we have a lot of, of planted areas that are restricted from, from human activity. There's one kind of on the right side of the screen here. There's a lot of uh, habitat space using mostly native plants that's intentionally created to, to provide ecological benefit. In the riprap or the rocks that you're seeing um, along the water's edge, there are tide pools built in, manufactured tide pools um, that provide habitat value. A few, uh, a few years ago, uh, a couple of us were, were out there taking a tour of the site and we actually saw baby horseshoe crabs in the, in the tide pools um, walking around. So they came in at, at, at high tide, they were there doing fine during during low tide because that pool had formed, and I, I would assume they went back out at, at high tide when, when the water came back above the tide pool. There's a lot of shallow water habitat around this site where they've changed the, the shape of the shoreline, and that didn't used to exist on this site. It used to be, it had to be dredged for um, for shipping activities, and there's very little shallow water habitat in, in New York Harbor. Um, because we're we have such an urbanized coastline, and then there's there's the the tide pool that I or sorry the um, um, tidal marsh that I mentioned also provides um, a lot of habitat space, and then when we think about access, that third pillar of resilience, ecology, and access, there's a lot of different ways that people can access this site. There are there's the uh, obviously if you look at the pier, there's lots of people actually getting out to the site. It's a very popular place. So there's access to the waterfront in that regard, but there's multiple ways to get down into the water. You've got kayak launches. You're looking at one of two beaches on the site. There's the marina access, but then there's other types of access here that Wedge encourages. So that 514 ship you see in the back, that's actually docked at the park itself because the maritime infrastructure to have ships tie up is there. And there's oftentimes, you know, Tall ships will come in or educational opportunities will come in and, and they can dock at, at, at this facility. You have two ferry docks at the, at the site, um, one, on, one on either end and there's the, the NYC ferries use this, use this park as one of their sites. So there's transportation access at the site. And these are all of the things that Wedge is designed to encourage more projects to do. Wedge isn't prescriptive in saying, you have to have tide pools. Absolutely, you, you, it's the most important thing, you have to have tide pools. We don't structure it like that, but we're creating an, an incentive through our, our scoring system to do things like that so that, that the, there are more resilience features, there are more ecological features when we create better access. So there are a series of six categories across Wedge. And the way it works is that Wedge is a points-based system. Within each of these categories, there's a set of what we call design strategies in credits. Those credits have different elements uh, of the design. And it's everything from how have you created um, biodiversity through native plant species to how have you used 
renewable energy to, you know, how have you increased the stormwater capacity uh, of a site and cleaned up stormwater before it enters the waterway or a, a, a municipal system. All of those different features, and there are 37 different credits in total that we're looking at, all of those have a different point value associated with them. So the, the higher performing a, a site, the more opportunities it has to, to score and anything that meets the threshold of 130 points out of a total of 250 earns what we call wedge verification. That's what we consider to be the gold standard for waterfront development is, is if you hit that, if you earn that wedge verification. So there's lots of flexibility in it because every waterfront site is going to be unique. That's why we can't be prescriptive. Not every site will look like Brooklyn Bridge Park. That's okay. Uh, but we've created this system that allows the flexibility while still really pushing projects to go well above and beyond what they'd be required to do from a regulatory perspective. The way that, the reason that we we set wedge up as a rating system is that this is there's there's opportunity through a rating system to shift the whole field while still working kind of site by site. So what a rating system does, and I think lead is the lead is the example of this done exceptionally well. Lead is not the only one out there. There's a number of others that wedge is modeled after in different capacities, but lead is is the, the, the huge success story and the original success story. What a rating system like Wedge does is that it allows uh, or it creates a set of consistent standards. If you go to Boston, Miami, New York, Roanoke, Chicago, all these different cities, the, the regulatory codes are gonna be different both at a state level and a local level. Community expectations are different. Definitions of what is resilient are going to be different. Um, so you, what Wedge really does is allow for a set of standards that is going to be consistent across all of the, the different geographies. And if you're Colleen sitting at SCAPE, having that kind of that, that consistency that works from one project to another that you can use as guidance from one project to another can be really helpful. Wedge and, and rating systems broadly celebrate the great projects. We want to see more projects like Brooklyn Bridge Park and Domino Sugar and Jose Marti Park the, in, in Miami. So really well designed projects that create a lot of public benefits. We want to make sure that there's lots of attention on those, that the the, the city agencies that are building those or the, the developers that are building those get credit for, for the, the effort that they put in, the extra expense of doing really solid design, um, extra expense and, and time and effort that it takes to create a really ecologically healthy site. Um, we want to make sure that there's attention drawn on those and that's going to then help other projects kind of set targets and, and drive results. Um, so what, what uh, wedge verification can do if you're, you know, if you're the, the design team or you are the one who's actually financing and building the site is that you can use wedge to say, we want, we want to meet this standard. We want to perform particularly well in these particular areas. And it can help kind of create that um, a really sound target as opposed to just saying we want to be more resilient. But what does that mean? We've created definitions of that within the standard. And then ultimately what that does is that it can help push change across the field. What we're, what we're seeing is that by creating consistent standards, by celebrating great projects, by helping projects set their own targets and help communities set targets for projects that can help move the rest of the field to, to perform better on, on sites. And it puts pressure on other projects to, to adhere either to the, to the standard directly or just be more resilient, ecological, or accessible more broadly. And how we see this, you know, if, if we're thinking about like the systems change level of wedge, 
you know, what Wedge is really designed to do is to help when there's public money or private money flowing to a waterfront project, we want to see that money spent better. And one of the big differentiators between WED and other standards, in addition to being just waterfront focused and bringing in all of the, the complexities and, and constraints of the waterfront, is that WEDGE is really focused on the opportunities that only exist in the waterfront and the public benefits that go along with those. So if we think about you know, where, where the benefits of this kind of design lie, it's not just for the, the developer themselves. You're looking at Greenpoint Landing in, in Brooklyn, that's the image on the screen. The, the developers of Greenpoint Landing are not the only ones that receive the benefits of of the, the wedge verified features of the site, but they've created a, a place that's welcoming and, and exciting for the community. So there are, are really broad public benefits. And that's where, where wedge has a lot of difference from lead and other standards that are a little more focused on just the benefits to the property itself. And these are some of the, the, the peers that are out there. So there's a landscape architecture one sites, there's Envision, which is, is focused on infrastructure and, 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 a, and a, a few others um, that, that exist in, in different parts of the country. So this the fact that we have these peers out there means that people are familiar in, in this field and, and particularly on the design side with the, the rating systems um, concept. So we don't usually have to kind of sell the, the idea of a rating system to, to projects. We're starting to partner with, with some of these. We, we present frequently with Green Building Initiative. We work with, we're, we're getting embedded in Green Marine, which is a, a kind of ports and shipping portfolio or agency level um, standard. Doesn't work at the site level, we do. So there's a nice complement. So there's, there's a lot of opportunity for the fact that we, we work within this space that, that, that is known to, to the design community um, and often work as a complement to, to some of the other standards that are out there. So there are 12 currently wedge verified sites. There are about to be 14. Um, it, in January, we'll announce two um, new sites that have just completed their verification. And there's a couple more that'll come um, later this winter and spring. But what I want to draw attention to on this slide is the diversity of types of sites. So Courtney said before that we work with everything except for single family homes. Um, and what you'll see, you'll see that reflected in, in this set of projects. So there are the, the great public parks like Brooklyn Bridge Park, Hunters Point South, Jose Marti Park in, in Miami, Riverfront Park in, in Wilmington, North Carolina. Those are great public spaces. But if we're thinking about how you do resilient, ecological, and accessible design, there's a real extent to which it's easier to do those things on a public park than it is a, um, an industrial facility or a port facility or other types of sites. But Wedge accommodates those too. So we have sites like Domino Sugar, Greenpoint Landing, Bronx Point, which are residential and, um, and mixed use developments. Bronx Point's actually affordable housing. You have Sims Recycling, Oak Point McKinnis Cement, San Diego Pilots Association, which are all working waterfront industrial sites. And there's an extent to which if we can get those sites to perform better for resilience, ecology, and access, that's actually a really significant impact because those are sites are the least likely to do it on their own. There's another, I'd say, 12 or so sites in the, the pipeline for verification, and those include a lot of offshore wind ports. Um, so there, there is kind of this mix still of public and private, residential, park, and industrial, um, both existing in and in the, the future. We approach this work through kind of three different, um, kind of three different program areas within Wedge. So there's the verification itself. That's where we get where we're actually doing a, a really in-depth review of projects. We're bringing in architects and engineers to like pour through the construction drawings and the, the, the different project documents and design documents to actually see, does this project meet the standard and then celebrate those that do. We have our Wedge Professionals program, which is 
to help educate architects, engineers, landscape architects, city officials, regulators, real estate developers on how does wedge work? What is wedge? What are the how do you do resilient, ecological, and accessible design? So we have this pipeline of folks who both work as advocates for us. It's often the, the wedge professionals are the ones who are out there touting the benefits of, of wedge on, on projects, but we're also then creating awareness and understanding of the, the, the system. And then there's the policy and finance realm where we're working with different state and local agencies to create incentives around wedge, partnering with the, the financial community to create kind of, or to position wedge as a way to validate whether investments are, are resilient. We're in a couple ESG or environment social governance um, um, rating systems um, is a way to, to validate that you know, the money that the investors are spending is doing good in the world. We're embedded in, in, in some of those. So there's different ways that we're spreading the spreading the wedge standard across different types of projects. And some of the benefits that that wedge has to a community is is that those communities are going to see reduced flood risk. They're going to get higher quality public spaces, reduced stormwater burdens, workforce development and maritime jobs, robust and diverse community engagement. Uh, we think that one, it, it, that's often why private sector developers choose to use Wedge as they see a lot of, of benefit in the engagement process um, for using Wedge, screenway and transit connectivity. And then kind of above all, Wedge shows that that your project is a, is a leader in, in great design. And then we also have a number of equity and environmental justice components that are embedded within Wedge. So we want to see that when projects are being built, that they're actively addressing equity issues and environmental justice issues that are present um, in and around the site. So we're asking projects to do an assessment for, are, are there environmental justice issues in this community or based on this site in particular that you need to be aware of in the, in the process? We wanna see that stakeholder engagement and, and community outreach actually results in changes. And that's something that we do a check for. Are there changes to the design as a result of engagement? We wanna see that things like program, programming on a site, which has a, there's a credit around that, that it's a low cost or affordable, uh, if not free. We wanna see reduced flood risk beyond the property line um, because we, we, we actually weight almost equally in the standard protection of the site itself and protection beyond the, the property line. If they can prevent flooding further inland, that's that's something that went really, really encourages. Things like local hiring and reduced industrial impacts, um, reduced um, emissions, reduced site contamination, those are all embedded in the standard. And then this is just a map of where we have our, our wedge professionals. You can see that we've grown outside of just New York and New Jersey to we now have hubs in Florida and different parts of California, Boston, Connecticut, where there's lots of, of professionals who are who are trained in wedge um, and starting to embed it into, into projects. And then these are just a few of the communities where we have, um, where we're embedded in the policy space, we're in a set of design guidelines and a stormwater ordinance in Miami, the sustainable infrastructure guidelines in, in, with Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, zoning code in New Rochelle, and there's a few other examples out there. So I'll hand it back off to, to Courtney, who's going to start a, a dialogue with Colleen. All right. Thanks so much, Joseph. All right. So I'm so excited to introduce you to Colleen Warren from SCAPE. And I'm going to be interviewing her as a practitioner, landscape architect, and, a, and SCAPE, one of the many firms that works with Wedge and talks to their clients about the benefits and moves um, their clients through the wedge process. So Lean, super to have you. And I'd love to just have you start out with describing who you are, what you do, your background. Uh, that would be great. And then I'll continue with some more questions for you. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I'm excited to chat about wedge and tell you a little bit about myself and the work that I do. So um, currently, I'm a senior associate at SCAPE, a landscape architecture firm that both Courtney and Joseph have been speaking about um, in New York. We have three offices um, across the country, New York, New Orleans, and San Francisco. 
Um, right now, I focus almost exclusively uh, on our built work portfolio, and I work almost exclusively on waterfront projects. And um, I think in terms of how I got to landscape architecture, I think like most young people, I didn't know that this profession was actually a thing. And um, during my undergraduate studies, I was uh, really pursuing a environmental science track, and that is what my um, degree is in. But I also was uh, minoring in architecture. And during that time, I took a landscape studio and an intro to landscape architecture course. And I realized it just opened my eyes. I was like, oh, this is it. This is exactly what I want to do. I've always been very deeply interested in sustainability. I, um, you know, I was thinking about this the other day, reflecting on it a little bit, but I almost half of my life, I've, I've lived in drought like conditions. And so the idea of how our cities can function better, the idea of how our cities can be more adaptive and sustainable has always been something that's been extremely intriguing to me. And I think I just, before my undergraduate degree and, and finding landscape architecture, I didn't really know what the tools were to be able to, to do that or to, to have actionable outcomes to, to those problems. Um, and so as soon as I found out what landscape architecture was, I very quickly decided that I was going to pursue it and uh, went and got my master's in landscape architecture degree from UC Berkeley. While I was at UC Berkeley, I worked at the Port of San Francisco and in their planning and development department um, for a, a, about two years. And during that time, the port was looking at the update to their waterfront land use plan. And that update was also looking at the idea of sea level rise and climate change, as well as a crumbling seawall. And um, to me, that was something that was deeply intriguing, I think, especially because I come from places that are don't have any water or have very little water. And so the idea of an abundance of water was something that I just couldn't really wrap my mind around. And so I really dove into it. And now that has really kind of, since that, that point, it's really kind of moved me in the direction of thinking about you know, um, adaptive design, thinking about really innovative nature-based solutions and uh, for how we can deal with sea level rise. And, and to be honest, it's what brought me to SCAPE. And, and again, so at SCAPE, I focus, again, almost exclusively on waterfront projects, um, some of our larger public waterfront projects. I am managing the construction of China Basin Park, which is ironically in San Francisco on port property. Um, as well as some various other uh, projects, one in Hoboken that we're just wrapping up now, um, and, and some new ones that uh, I'm actually going to see today. So that's that's a bit about my background and how I kind of got here. That is so cool. All right, great. So I would love to hear from you just personally what you think about when you think about the biggest challenges that we're facing from climate change, in particular to the work you do and, and waterfront-related work. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think in, in really our, our coastal environments, specifically in tidal waters, we're really grappling with this idea of sea level rise and specifically coming to a consensus around sea level rise projections and what those should mean for design and future flooding and future flood events, but also really how do you develop designs that work today, but also work in the future that provide access, that provide ecosystem services, and that provide really robust, equitable experiences. Um, we're really trying to understand this kind of condition and how specifically to design for it. And we, we know that we need adaptable designs. We know that we need to integrate monitoring and maintenance and adaptive management. And I, I think we're pushing some of that work forward. I think Wedge also helps to push that work forward in creating a guideline for you know, best practices around that. That's it's 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 something that we're we're thinking about daily, and we're trying to innovate and iterate around how we can create these spaces that are robust and interesting, and that the community wants to go to and people want to experience, but also that can adapt over time and and have a, a long design life for everybody, right? For developers, for uh, uh, community members for the the public uh you know institutions that, that are funding these things um, you know how do you make these designs last um is something that is is um is challenging but it's there there are solutions to it i think we we we've been able to to prove that at scale 
So I'm just curious, um, based on what you said, how you all, how SCAPE and maybe the, the landscape architecture for, uh, field in general is thinking about sea level rise projections. So you mentioned agreeing on projections, but like, where do you personally land in terms of like, what, what type of future are we actually planning for? And, and if you think about the headlines that are coming out, I know those aren't like in terms of what's happening to Antarctica, in Antarctica, like those results aren't necessarily already embedded within the UN standards, for example, or other standards. So how do you all think about that, especially as the science is revealed and maybe not yet incorporated into, into formal processes? Yeah, I think it's I, I I think it's um it's a it's an interesting question, and I, I I think that we are we're continually looking at the latest science, especially with with Pippa, who is what our resilience principle, which is a very kind of um, interesting uh, position to have in a landscape architecture firm. I think most landscape architects are thinking about resilience generally, but to name a specialist in in a firm is something that I think is. Um, I don't want to say new, but it is something that uh, is not quite common. And I, you know, I think in terms of design, we're we're really thinking about the adaptability of design and the adaptability of of how you put something in the ground. And maybe it's not thinking about a future flood elevation specifically and and setting your your site to that datum, right? Because if that if that were the case, we would need to raise all of our sites by X amount of feet um, to make sure that it never floods. I think what we're trying to explore as options are how do we create spaces that can be floodable? How do we create spaces where, you know, maybe part of a park can flood, uh, maybe not daily, but maybe a part of a, a flood, a, a park can flood yearly and it can adapt, right? It, the, the correct materials are there for it to adapt over time. Um, and, and you know, once water recedes, it's, it's, it's back to normal. And, you know, assuming that, that, you know, health, safety and welfare of people that they're not out uh, at a park during a major flood event, but, you know, how do we, how do we think about that adaptability over time? I think is is not just raising sites. It's really thinking about how can the sites begin to per perform at different elevations um, for what they're, and how do we place program in those elevations that is meaningful and works with that kind of adaptive idea of how these sites can work over time. That makes a ton of sense. So thinking back to Wedge, what, what do you personally feel is the value of Wedge as a, as a standard uh, and the cat, how do you approach one? Yeah, I mean, I think what's so valuable about Wedge specifically is that it, it's about waterfront, right? And it addresses the very unique considerations of waterfront sites. Um, it, it has this kind of multi-factor looking at performance and um, you know, so often, as Joseph had mentioned, so often these kind of metric metric based performance um, criteria are looking at one very specific criteria, whether that's sustainability or that's accessibility. Um, and Wedge really looks at a, a large cross section. Um, you know, it, it balances these kind of multi performance factors, um, whether that's you know community engagement, which is something that we're deeply passionate about. Um, or it is future flood elevations and projecting climate change scenarios. And um, this is really kind of, I think, the very unique element that Wedge brings to these kind of standard um, performance-based um, criteria. And then how have you seen um, clients interact with the standard? And uh, so we had a question um, from a supporter a while ago, like, well, how many how many uh, projects actually pass wedge? Like, wouldn't it be a uh, wouldn't it be a stronger standard if you didn't accept all of the the if if most of the projects that went through it or like a handful at least didn't didn't uh, didn't uh, get the verification? And I explained like part of the reason why there most of the clients that that go through the process end up receiving the verification is that there that that the process itself is a dialogue that ends up engaging the design the designers and the and the owners in figuring out what the best designs are. So anyway, that that's one of the things that I think about a lot. So I'm just kind of curious what you think about that or just and just how you've seen clients and it take wedge and, and how that changes things or how that works. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that it, you know, some sometimes it can it can appear to be just another kind of certification that that architects or landscape architects want to 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 get. But I I I think that in my experience, clients have been have either we we've had many clients that have come to us and and said we want this site to be wedge certified and um you know I I think that that's and and even the clients who don't know about wedge that we 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 say you know we're really looking at this site um to become wedge certified is this something you're interested in but in addition to that I think the way that we explain it is that these kind of performance measures or factors are something that are kind of deeply ingrained in the design process already and so it's it's like the the way that we are designing the site now is 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 really kind of these these ideas are already in the ethic of, of what we're doing. They're in the project goals of what we're doing. And so to add this extra uh, level of metrics and measuring and um, really looking at the site holistically and what it is that you're accomplishing, I think is really interesting for clients to see, right? Like, because it is a large cross section, because it's looking at everything from, you know, monitoring adaptive management, uh, habitat patch sizes, stormwater infrastructure. Like, I think, I think it's, it's very neat for clients to be able to see, like, this is what your site is doing. And isn't that a, a very interesting thing rather than, oh, we're just, we're, we're just building a waterfront park for you, right? Like they, they, they can see that, that there are, there are levels and there are metrics and there are measurable outcomes to what it is that they are putting into the world. Great, so uh, we're going to be able to open it up to questions soon. I do have a question for you that I was thinking about and, and Joseph can answer as well, but just what does it mean for Wedge to um, apply in the verification standard um, and, and receiving verification? What does that mean for industrial facilities? Just breaking that down a little bit. I think that's one thing that people don't see all the time, that there are some real opportunities with industrial development um, to meet these standards for, especially for ecology and access that I think are a little unknown to the general public and, and other people as well. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that when we're brought into these more kind of industrial sites, and Joseph, you can jump in at any time too, but when we're, we're, when we're brought into these sites and we're seeing this in, in, in increasingly given kind of decommissioning of some waterfront sites or or the idea that, that um, uh, waterfront industrial sites or the idea that waterfront industrial sites also want to have some sort of ecological value if they are going to be along the waterfront. Um, at least in the idea of turning waterfront or industrial waterfront sites into into public spaces, um, for for us using wedge as a guideline to kind of move that design through and think about how we might um, address some of those kind of maritime activities or heavy industrial use um, is it is a really great guideline, um, especially because there aren't that many guidelines out there for this kind of large industrial or maritime use. Um, so that's been helpful for us when we're initially starting kind of our site analysis and thinking through concepts. Um, and I'm sure Joseph, you have many other, uh, you know, experiences around that, but that's just been my specific experience along the waterfront in New York. Yeah, I, I think there's a, there's a few kind of common characteristics of industrial waterfront sites that, that we see in that, Wedge really leverages to create a, a, a stronger outcome. So one of those is that they, because they have, they're often water dependent uses, they need you know, boats and vessels and stuff to be able to, to pull up. It tends to be really deep water. It tends to be like concrete and steel right at the water's edge. So there's opportunity for Wedge to push them to think more about natural or nature-based features that can work alongside the infrastructure that they need. We see a lot of these industrial sites in historically low income and underserved neighborhoods that don't have waterfront access. Um, and the access components of Wedge really push those projects to find ways to create public access. And if we look at, you know, one of my favorite sites to use as an example is Bronx, or um, sorry, um, Oak Point McKinnis Cement in the Bronx. To cement import facility, they've got they've got giant ships of cement that that pull up and pump um, the cement from ships to to onshore. 
they've created a public walkway that's used for different by different arts nonprofits, and it creates the only way to get to the waterfront and even see the waterfront in that entire Oak Point neighborhood. Um, so you're creating you're creating access there. You're creating that access in lower income communities. They tend to be places that are prone to more flooding. Sometimes that's because it's you know they were they're older areas that were were designed to a lower standard. Sometimes that's because it's really old stormwater infrastructure there, and a lot of concrete and asphalt that can't absorb rainwater. Wedges a wedge works to address all of these different things. What we've seen with the offshore wind industry is that the, the developers who, all but one of them in, in New York and New Jersey in recent bids to sell power to the state to, to build these offshore wind developments, the, the goals uh, or the, they all used wedge in their proposals to show the state agencies that, hey, we want to be good neighbors. We want to be good community partners where our ports are going. Um, and that was that was something that the state agencies um, really bought into and understood. All right, great. So we have um, qu questions now from the audience. So um, actually, I will start with uh, the one we just got and then go to um, Paula's question. So Marjorie is asking, can anyone comment on the September 15th storm that hit New York City so hard? Did the wedge sites perform better than waterfronts as usual? So I, I don't have data on that specific storm, but by design, I would expect them to. Um, so there's a there's a, a few expectations that we have within Wedge around um, precipitation-based storms. Um, so they're expected to accommodate a higher or a more significant rainfall than uh, they'd be required to by um, this New York City building code, we expect a, a, a more significant storm. Um, we expect that they're, they're or it, encourage them to use green infrastructure um, around that. That's going to take pressure off the municipal system. So that's going to kind of keep water out of the, the combined sewer overflow system that, that in a heavy rainstorm is going to dump sewage into, into our waterways. We're, we're, we, we want sites to use green infrastructure to avoid um, um, putting extra burden on, on those systems. And then when we've talked to, uh, we, we, I, I, I opened with Brooklyn Bridge Park, you know, I had a, a conversation with their, their director of capital projects um, a couple of years ago, and he was adamant and, and said multiple times in that conversation that Brooklyn Bridge Park will handle any storm that Mother Nature can throw at it better than other sites uh, across the harbor because they built in resilient design from the beginning. Um, and I think that's, that's something that we expect to be true across all of these sites. So um, even if I can't, I, I don't know the data from that, from, from the September storm, which was a really heavy rainfall, um, they, they, they are all designed to, to be able to handle um, the sites, that, that kind of rainfall better than other, other waterfront sites. I'll just say quickly too, we have we have talked to most of the verified sites about performance under storms and uh all it they have we can either interpret their responses, they're doing so they're responding so well that they that the sites don't even know what the storms are, like it's just not an issue for them. Or and but also the way to describe it is that um there hasn't been specific tracking yet. So that is something that we're we're pulling in. But so far, um the the qualitative analysis is that um, they're they're all performing very well. So I see now that Paula's question she jumped off, but she was just mentioning um, how important Annabelle Basin is. So I think that we, we take that as an important comment. Is there another question from the audience? So I have a, a question at for or or a. A question that I think is just, I kind of know the answer to, but I wonder about how people, um, whether or not people know about this, which is when we say the term nature-based features, I think that's a, it's like an acronym in a way. <laughs> people who don't work in this field don't really know what that means. So can maybe, I mean, Colleen and, and Joseph, if you could um, describe like 
so if you have like it, it's, it's an, and just going back to what Joseph was saying, so if you have a an edge that's concrete and steel, what are nature based features that could be applied to change that to make to make that edge um, that water's edge much more ecologically sound? Um, I, I can speak maybe a little to a very specific example that we actually just presented the concept for in Hoboken, um, which is um, the idea of a kind of diverse waterfront edge experience. And what we were really trying to accomplish there was looking at pulling back the shoreline, creating a tidal wetland um, that could both infiltrate stormwater runoff from the site itself, but also you know, mitigate any sort of uh, uh, storm surge or any sort of wave action um, that would have sills, uh, kind of planted sills along its uh, along its kind of outside edge that again could kind of mitigate wave action. Um, and then in, in that example, specifically at that tidal wetland, we are incorporating, Joseph mentioned these, but the e-concrete um, tidal pools, as well as the tow revetments. So those are really locking that sill in and helping to protect the grade, as well as providing, um, you know, the e-concrete units are made out of a very special uh, concrete mixture where um, they have ecological benefits, kind of, um, they can create habitat within them. Joseph mentioned horseshoe crabs. There are many different kind of, uh, um, kind of marine-like uh, critters that can can live in in those and and uh, thr and thrive in them. In addition to that, we're kind of pulling back some of the shoreline and creating living shorelines, and those are are really um, you know taking the slope and and making it easing it a little bit and creating space for um, you know um, some aquatic vegetation, uh, some potentially some upland vegetation um, that can kind of work as this cross section that we typically see in wetlands that that living shoreline would begin to mimic that. Um, and, and so th those are just some of the experiences that we're hoping to create there. Um, it's a, it's both a combination of quote unquote nature-based solutions, living shorelines have been around for, for, for forever, um, but also incorporating some of these more kind of innovative um, forward thinking solutions like the e-concrete, um, as well as you know, thinking through how one might build a tidal wetland in an, in an urban environment, right? Um, kind of pushing that idea of, of that forward a little bit. That's great. All right, Judith, you have your hand raised. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, I'm wondering, do you work mostly, I know you work mostly in urban environments, but there is a disaster going on in the town of, sorry, the village of Montauk at the end of Long Island, the ocean beach, which has been eroding because there's no new sand. All the sand from Montauk has been moved westward in, into other, you know, closer parts of Long Island. And, and there are two motels that never should have been built where they are, but they have been built and they are in, in danger of getting flooded. And the town is trying to protect these two motels and they put down sandbags and other things in the way. And it was a disaster and it didn't work. And, and is there something that Wedge could do to help Montauk if, they, if you were asked to do so? So I don't know enough about the specifics of that particular site to know the the, the dynamics, but we 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 do have a, a somewhat similar um, issue on uh, a, a wedge project that's in the pipeline. This is one of the ones that'll be announced um, just after the the new year. So I can't share where it is, um, but. We have a, there's a, a state park in, in Illinois along Lake Michigan um, that's building in a breakwater um, into the, it's a couple hundred yards out into the into the lake and it's to address beach erosion, which sounds like it's the same issue that, that you're seeing in Montauk. Um, the storms keep uh, washing away the sand at that site. This, the state of Illinois has been bringing in sand by the truckload for years and years and years. It keeps getting washed away, these breakwaters. And it's not all that dissimilar to like the living breakwaters 
uh, project in in Staten Island that that Escape is, is leading. Um, but the in, the goal of that particular project is that it's going to it's going to protect the the beach so that 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 sediment that sand um, isn't continually washed away. And that that kind of solution could be something that works in Montauk. There's a lot of you know that's that's something that takes a very detailed and, and complex um, engineering assessment to figure out what are the what are the right solutions here. So it, it's not a one size fits all. If you plop something like that down, it will solve the problem. Um, the same way that sandbags might work in some scenarios and they're not gonna work in, in others. Um, but that's actually an upcoming wedge verified site is, is addressing that specific issue in another place. All right, thanks. So uh, there's one last question, or not last, we have a little more time, but Jennifer Costley is asking, does the WEDGE team provide an opportunity for experts and projects to share their learnings and best practices in an ongoing forum, not just industry conferences? Yeah, so there's a, a, a couple ways that we we uh, provide those opportunities. Conferences are, are, are one of them, but um, for every wedge verified site, we do two different articles in the WaterWire blog. One is the announcement that comes from Waterfront Alliance, um, just kind of giving the overview of the site, talking about about how it performed in the in the standard. And then the other one, and I think it's the more interesting one, is from the design team itself, and they take an element or a couple elements of the site that were particularly unique. And then go into into depth on on those. So we had one recently on um, Jose Marti Park in in Florida, and they talked about the living shoreline that they built there and how that provides like manatee habitat protection. Um, the Brooklyn Bridge Park one um, that we actually released it in another article on it. Um, I think it was last year on the wave attenuator and like how that works um, and and how they can be. Um, created to be even more ecologically beneficial and kind of create a living or nature-based solution or nature-based feature out of the, the wave attenuator. So that water wire um, blog is a, is one of the ways we do that. We do pretty regular um, webinar programming. So with Climate Week, we we always have a, a web webinar that brings in different projects and different features. Those happen on a, there's, there's some ad hoc ones as well um, that that occur and we're actually going to ramp those up this this year um, so there's lots of learning opportunities and, and typically those will include kind of a little bit of an overview from of, of wedge for me but then we'll bring in architects and engineers and landscape architects on the projects who are putting this stuff into practice um, and having them share what's work what are, what are we learning what are we seeing out there great all right do we have one last question before we break all right, so I highly encourage everyone to take a look at the WaterWire blog, our, our, our online newsletter. It comes out once a month. If you're not receiving it for any reason, please let us know, but it is the place where almost every single month we have at least one or two uh, articles on Wedge and how Wedge is performing. And, um, and Mackenzie just put the sign up link in the chat as well. And I just hope that this is an example of one of the things that organizations like Waterfront Alliance and, and many others are doing about how we can face the climate crisis and that there are solutions and answers. And so I hope you've seen a demonstration of that today and really excited for all of your support and questions. And if you have additional questions, please do not hesitate to let us know. We'd, we'd love to be helpful. So. With that, we're gonna break and, and um, we'll see you in February or March for our next uh, webinar. Thank you so much to Colleen for volunteering her time this morning and for sharing her background and her expertise. And thank you so much to Joseph as well for all of your great work. Take care, everyone. Have a great end of the year and we'll see you next time.